great. It looks like we have everyone, all of our panelists on the line now. Great. So we may go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to the, I think it's our 11th APCO community webinar, which is building a career in sustainability. Um, we're joined by some really fantastic guest speakers today. So I'm really looking forward to the session. So thanks everyone for joining us. So June 5th is World Environment Day, yay, which is exciting. So happy World Environment Week. And, and I think in celebration of World Environment Day and all of the great work that's happening here in Australia and globally, we really wanted to take some time to reflect. I think at APCO we have 1,500 different member organizations that we get to work with. We really have the privilege of seeing some of the best of the best in terms of sustainability initiatives that come through um, our membership and in, into a network and with our different stakeholders. And, but we wanted to really come together as a community and to be able to talk about what makes those great initiatives. And, and we know that a lot of times it's people power. So looking at some of those individuals that have really been able to shine and bring the community together and to create some fantastic sustainability initiatives. So the purpose of today is for really you, for everyone here that's listening to ask questions, to hear from some fantastic individuals that are doing some great work in this space. Um, and to, to continue to learn, we can all continually improve and build on that work and try and be in terms of global best practice, really showing the world what Australia has and, and growing more into the future. So continue to encourage you to ask questions throughout the session and, and I hope you really enjoy these speakers because I know they're all incredible individuals. A little bit about our agenda and what we have going today. We'll just do a quick welcome. Happy World Environment Day again, that's June 5th. And then I'll introduce our speakers. So first we're going to hear from Andrew Peterson. Andrew is the Chief Executive Officer for the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia, or BCSDA. And Andrew is a former lawyer and now serves as the CEO um, for Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. He's also an APCO board member. Um, and uh, BCSDA is part of the Australian Network Partners for the World Council for Sustainable Development. Sorry, lots of letters in there for me this morning. Um, Andrew has, for over 20 years, helped clients understanding and capacity to respond to the reality that environmental and sustainability issues have moved from the fringes of business world to the top shareholders' agendas. The concept of sustainability has gained traction among senior management, employees, regulators, and customers. The miscalculations or misjudgments related to environment or sustainability issues have serious repercussions on how the world judges a company and values it shares. So really looking forward to hearing Andrew's perspective on sustainability initiatives and linking that thought back up into kind of the global scale. And after we hear from Andrew, we're going to be hearing from Dermot. So Dermot Omorda is the Quality and Sustainability Manager at Endeavor Drinks Group, which looks after BW, BWS and Dan Murphy's. Dermot is also the APCO Sustainability Champion Award winner for 2019. And he's the lead organizer of the Wine Industry Sustainable Packaging Alliance, or WISPA, as we affectionately call it, which is a collaborative group of individuals working together to improve packaging sustainability in the wine supply chain. Dermot has worked in partnership with APCO to develop the sustainable packaging guidelines for the beverage industry and has initiated a number of specific projects supporting the wine industry to achieve the 2025 national packaging targets. And finally, we have Fiona Baxter. So Fiona is now the Packaging Development Manager at Simplot Australia. And in 2019, was also an APCO Sustainability Champion Award finalist. Fiona was formerly the Coles Group Manager for Responsible Sourcing, leading the development and implementation of the Coles Group sustainable and ethical sourcing programs, including certified products, sustainable packaging, supply chain compliance and capacity building, investor relations, animal welfare, sustainable agriculture, public reporting, and managing a cross-functional team of subject matter experts. 
As a qualified environmental scientist, Fiona has previously held corporate sustainability roles at Meyer and Telstra, developing organizational sustainability strategy, implementing internal and supply chain programs, overseeing operational sustainability on waste, energy, and water, and leading community investment on all aspects of public sustainability reporting. So those are some very impressive CVs right there that I've just lifted off for you. Uh, so we're among some incredibly impressive individuals and I encourage you all to ask questions throughout these different ses sessions and then we'll leave some room for Q&A at the end. But for now, I will hand over to Andrew to give us a little bit about some of his tips um, for creating successful sustainability initiatives. Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Meredith. And thank you to APCO for the opportunity of talking with you today, uh, albeit virtually and hopefully in the comfort of either your workplace or your home. Um, the, the question is an interesting one because the, the challenge is what is the measure of impact, what is the measure of success, and what is the sustainability initiative uh, that is contextually relevant to not just your organisation, but also uh, the broader um, stakeholders of which your organisation uh, operates in and depends upon for their social licence to operate. In the BCSD community, we focus on three components in what we call our approach, which has to underpin um, all successful initiatives. They are Firstly, co uh, collaboration. You've got to connect companies, partners, and sectors to deliver results where no single company could achieve that outcome alone. And that's, that's very much the, the raison d'etre of the, the Business Council for Sustainable Development right across the globe. The second is, and it's one that's true for most companies, and that is innovation. Innovation to deliver uh, pioneering, in whatever that context may mean for your organisation, sustainable business solutions. And by that I mean an economic dividend, uh, environmental and social value, and an underpinning of governance and ethics and transparency that can be shown to be accountable for the outcomes that you deliver. The third is valuation. Uh, it's an interesting one because for us at the end of the day, there must be a goal that an economy which is based on true value, true profits and true cost will actually ensure that sustainable companies are in turn more successful. Now with that, the four things that we consider on absolutely every initiative that we do are firstly impact, secondly outcome, third output, and finally activity. And I might start with activity first. Don't do an initiative if somebody else has already done it. Simple as that. The activity has to be something that is not going to reinvent the wheel. There's so much intelligence, resources, tools available to you out there that are freely available, either on the WBCSD website, the United Nations Global Compact website, uh, so many available insights into how other companies have tackled challenges. So make sure you do your homework in relation to that, um, whether that activity, that initiative is going to uh, either reinvent the world or in fact be a new spoke to the world. The second is output. You really have to understand what is the specific output that's going to redefine the value for your business. So for example, uh, a new business model for a particular product, now, particularly if you're using circularity principles and the work that APCO has done, make sure that that output is going to be tangible to all parts of your stakeholder community. And that includes the treasury function. It's not only the treasury function, but it's certainly one that's going to see the value of what you've created. At the next level, what is the outcome that you want to achieve by the initiative? Be very clear about how you're going to articulate it. So for example, a lot of work is being done by a number of companies in a number of sectors at the moment around uh, climate risk, or to use its long name, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. That's an important one because its implementation of that as an initiative in your organisation is going to help to reveal value. It's going to identify assets that are under distress. It's going to uh, realise credit risk that you may have, certainly technology and physical risk. 
And with that, you're going to bring a lot of value to what your company then invests in into the future. At its highest level though, we want to make sure that every initiative that we undertake and the members of the BCSD for that matter do, aligns with the business strategy to implement the sustainable development goals. So no initiative gets off the ground within our organisation unless we can be quite clear as to what that uh, activity, what that initiative is going to deliver for the betterment of mankind, the protection of the environment, and ultimately an effective outcome for society. I might leave it there, Meredith, and hand back to you. Great, thank you, Andrew. I think that's really um, interesting and insightful. So doing your homework, always good. We should all be doing our homework and that link back to the sustainable development goals. We, did, we talked a little bit about those for anyone that missed the session last week. We had um, Braz from Banksia Foundation, the CEO there talking a lot about some best practices and companies that are using the SDGs and, and how they implement that and then communicate back out that work that they're doing as well. So thank you, Andrew. Um, all right, Dermot, we may hand over to you now, if you're with us. There he is. I'm here, Meredith. Hi, How are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for joining us today. And yeah, we'll thank you. Over to you. And maybe if you can give us a little bit of background on the WISP work and, and some of your insights into the successful sustainability initiatives you've been involved with. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much, Meredith, and uh, thank you to AFCO. Um, it's great to be here. I'm really I'm quite uh, honoured and privileged to uh, have been invited. So, uh, yeah, I'd just like to, I suppose, share some insights with the group on uh, WISPA. So, uh, this was an, an, an alliance we formed about two years ago, so back in September 2018. And uh, it kind of came off the, the idea of uh, having a shared problem for the industry. So the industry issue really was around packaging. Uh, we were, I suppose, at that really early stage of getting uh, some sustainability initiatives happening within Endeavour uh, Drinks. And a lot of that was aligned with what Woolworths Group were driving for their 2020, their 20 goals for the 2020 initiatives. Um, and we basically felt that, you know, obviously the group is more supermarkets orientated. What what is it really that our business is about? And um, we're the business itself is vertically. It's a vertically integrated wine business primarily. Uh, we do then uh, engage with co-packers co for uh, beer and cider, spirits, etc. But uh, in, within our own business, we have uh, two wineries, packaging facilities, and a, an entire supply chain logistics route DCs back into retail. So uh, it's quite a unique business in itself. And what we looked at then was the, the packaging element. And um, at that point, we just decided we'd have a discussion with APCO. We hadn't really developed a relationship with APCO at the time. And uh, the, the vision was, you know, if we could get this collective together uh, to sit down and really map out a couple of issues within our own industry and work with them collaboratively, uh, we would probably get a better result than trying to uh, address a particular issue that was just been managed by, say, one one business. So uh, presented to the idea to APCO, APCO really, um, one of their clear roles in it was to be uh, Switzerland in, in the endeavor. Uh, and that primarily was around, uh, I'd say, the the you, you basic you've got push pull but you've also got those tendencies where you've got a relationship between a customer and a supplier and uh, because of those commercial boundaries uh, what we're used to working within uh, within the relationship is a bit can be a, the expectations can be a bit different than what the intents are so the intent really was this collaboration and bringing Apco into the fold really helped to set them up as Switzerland and then around that, we had about seven, uh, I think seven wineries. Um, we had a number of uh, industry bodies, so uh, the Australian grape and uh, grape growers and winemakers, and then also the regional um, industry body, Soya, for South Australia, and uh, Green Industry South Australia was one of the government agencies, and then APCO. And that then set, uh, I suppose, 
we just basically spent two days working together, uh, learned a lot about the value chain, and basically did an end-to-end -end map. Sorry, we also had the suppliers of packaging, and uh, then also right through to the recyclers. So it was that end-to-end -end value chain. And a lot of different companies brought then their own knowledge of the particular part of the value chain that they exist in and operate. And you, one of the key things we found was we didn't have a full picture. So bringing all those key people together really was that was bringing that uh, I suppose a, 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 a collaboration of sorts, a, a collective of shared knowledge. And with that shared knowledge, we actually became to understand issues that were quite relevant and uh, known by certain parts of the uh, value chain, but not known to the rest. And bringing that group down together, we actually worked on how to solve different issues and different problems along that value chain with packaging. Uh, we aligned to the 2025 uh, goals of APCO, so that was kind of our fundamental objective. But uh, we set up a couple of quick wins just to give bring in some momentum to the group uh, around uh, just, you know, um, things that we picked up around a two-day uh, piece where we actually went and walked the value chain from uh, uh, packaging manufacturer through to uh, winery, packaging, the uh, distribution center store, and then also a material recycling facility. Um, achieved them and basically every three months uh, broke into project teams. And then every three months we'd come back and just do a review on where those mini projects were happening. Um, then I think a year later, uh, we looked at the, the group again and just basically just asked how we were going, uh, did a bit of an evaluation of the progress to date. Uh, how happy we were and what we what we were content with keeping and what we were content with changing and really was it uh, you know did we see value in continuing the, the group so uh, the decision at that stage was yes and now we're into our second year running and uh, closed off a couple of more projects and I believe there's one currently running now at the moment so yeah we're looking to get a couple more on, uh, under it um, I think the you know some of the, the the key things there for me around making it su a success were ensuring we had a, a kind of a common shared goal. Uh, so there were uh, I suppose projects that were quite aligned to particular companies that they were trying to get off the ground, but bringing them to the table, uh, they 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 basically were aligned to the fundamental objectives that they were taking in. So that was a, a real benefit to them. Because uh, they got, I suppose, a uh, greater resource and capability to help uh, execute those projects. Uh, aligned to the common vision, the, uh, that bur I suppose the burning platform piece. Uh, I think the challenge of bringing some, a group like this together, say, five years ago, um, I just wouldn't have seen it happening. A lot of this has been driven by customers. Customers are asking us a lot around uh, sustainable products, so the credentials. So it's not just around packaging, it's around uh, uh, vineyard management, it's around uh, the biodynamic, organic, all of these, uh, I suppose, uh, markers in what a customer is looking for uh, resonate with them around what they see in the world that's happening today. And a lot of customers are concerned with how the world is going. So the choices they make around the purchases, uh, the, the products they purchase, are now been driven not only by what they like, but also the, those credentials that are linked to those products. So it's a great opportunity, you know, from a value perspective, it's quite aligned to my values, but it's great now that that momentum and that, uh, I suppose that, that call for action is now there and the support now, not just of my business, but of the industry and of the customers uh, is behind it as well. Yeah, so that's uh, so that's kind of that's whisper. Um, I don't know any other questions, tips on um, getting into sustainability. I, it's uh, quite a newbie, uh, to be quite honest. My background's uh, I'm a microbiologist. Uh, I went into brewing, manufacturing, uh, then into uh, this spirits and carbonated soft drinks. So quite a you know uh, um, quite a, a veteran now of the drinks industry, uh, now in retail, but. Um, I think it's just, for me, it was just having that, seeing the need. Uh, two years ago, it wasn't. I was moving into my role as quality, a group quality manager. And uh, I put the, I basically put, I asked for 
sustainability to be linked into my role. There was um, obviously there was a movement within Woolworths Group, but we hadn't got the momentum yet. So I was I put my hand up to help drive it uh, within Endeavour. Um, got a couple of wins around solar, uh, energy reduction, uh, waste, and then obviously then with the packaging. And since then uh, we've picked up the momentum. There's more uh, there's more resources now available to us and we're getting more organized now and actually building a strategy for the next three years around sustainability. Uh, the network you build, the people you meet, uh, I think they're invaluable. I've met a lot of experts, people that have been working in this uh, area for you know uh, quite a number of years more than I have and have actually gone out and gone through different uh, industries, uh, worked as consultants and you know they and they've been very uh, open with you know sharing information uh with myself and i've been learning from them and uh, i think there's some good education out there as well uh, i think something i'm looking at is the university of sydney uh their graduate certificate in sustainability which i believe goes on to a master's level uh, so that gives you some sort of uh, i suppose uh, training background and just getting some structure and how you approach uh, uh, you know, how you approach this field so i think the, it's the motivation it, it's really like this is this is a very important uh, field to be working in. Uh, not not more, you know. If I look at climate change, I look at the the challenges we've got around packaging and waste. Uh, it's no better time to actually get involved. Like again, a couple of years ago, the the title of sustainability manager didn't exist either. So uh, you know things are changing, and uh, it's you know I think it's no sooner than it needs to be than now to actually get these uh, initiatives up and running. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Dermot. I think that's really great. We, we, we often talk about the, the whisper case study when we talk about the collective impact model. That uh, first yes. year we can, I like King Paul Switzerland, never been there, but I hear they have nice chocolate. And so we would happily be Switzerland um, to help kind of establish those frameworks. <laughs> no, I think. Uh, members yeah. so that you can work through those different areas. Now, the, the, the work in support of that goes just been, uh, you know, it's just been incredible and uh, testament to, you know, where I've, I've seen the organization say 10 years ago to where it is now, it's, it is chalk and cheese. Uh, and I think the, you're an active uh, participant and driver in the, in the positive change. And I would not see WISPA in the position it is now and as successful as it has been without the support from APCO. Thank you. Wow. It's great to be working with You're you guys. Welcome. And thanks for sharing that, Dermot. Um, we've got some great questions coming in. I encourage everyone to keep those coming. Uh, some questions from Dermot. We're going to hand over now to Fiona to take us through a little bit of her journey. Uh, in sustainability and her kind of career journey from there. Thanks, okay. Meredith. No worries. And you just tell me when you're ready to. to yeah, far away, Meredith. Um, thanks, everyone. It's really amazing to see so many people um, on the webinar. So hopefully um, this can be helpful for you. I thought it might be useful just to quickly run through the quite complex path um, that my career has taken, as I know it can often be hard to sort of plot it. So I thought I'll just quickly run you through a whistle stop tour, but also touch on some of the initiatives that I've been involved with on the way. So I guess the, the starting point was for me, even from being very young, just an absolute love of nature. And then really that sort of um, directed my, I guess, study choices. So from a very, um, um, you know, love of nature, I thought I didn't know what I was doing. So I thought I'll pick environmental science. Um, so that's, that's the degree that I did actually found that was mostly applied chemistry, but actually I absolutely loved it. So really enjoyed that um, scientific base, which I think set me up really well for the future. So after graduating, it's a funny little picture of a sheep there. Um, I really didn't know how to go about getting my first job coming out of uni and very, very fortunately for me and um, very forever thankful to the professor that gave me the first job that I ever had that was in research at RMIT. And, and the job was that the research job was actually looking at the reuse of agricultural industry wastes. 
So the, the little sheep there represents the wool scour waste that I had to work with and work out how to compost it with um, hair from the tanneries and, and a whole range of other things. But I think what that really did was set me on that path around waste and the circular economy. So um, it was very fortunate. So from there, I went um, into an education role with Eco Recycle Victoria at the time, now Sustainability Victoria. So I was um, an educator out in, in Gippsland for Eco Recycle into the community around how to recycle and what it was all about. Um, that really did sort of further sort of set that career path for me in, in the area of materials cycling. From there, I went into consulting. And I think consulting is a fantastic way to learn so many different topics um, and really build your network. So if you have an opportunity to do a stint in consulting, I absolutely um, encourage you to give it a go because um, you, you can broaden your knowledge of different sustainability topics, um, build those networks, which may then build your career going forward from there. And, and also it just pushes you a bit to be presented with a problem and have to go, yes, we can look at that and do something about it and then go and work out how you're going to do that. So I did some consulting work um, when I was with Nolan ITU at the time with, um, a, with Census, which was part of Telstra, um, looking at the phone book recycling program. Now, phone books don't even really exist anymore. I'm, I think they still have some, but um, this shows my age. But I went in there and designed for them a new look recycling program. So previously, I don't know if any of you um, in Australia remember the book munchers that used to be at BP service stations where you would have to take your phone books back and drop them off. Um, so I came in and did some work from them around how we could get that into the curbside system. And I ended up being offered the job as the environment, national environment manager there after delivering that piece of work. And I was lucky enough to then be able to implement that plan. So um, we did a, a big program integrating um, phone books into the curbside system, working with the sorters, working with education, um, pulling in also our waste from the printer sites as well, which we're actually able to turn into a significant resource and profit. And with that money, we were then able to sponsor um, the development of Recycling Near You, which was, um, it still goes on strong now. So I had a call one day when we were there from, from John D to saying, we've got this great idea around this website where you know, people can log in and find out where to recycle things. And, and we're honoured enough to be able to give that seed funding out of the income that we were getting from the Book Muncher program, which is absolutely fantastic. So from there, I uh, complicated my life by um, having um, a baby. And so I went back into consulting, which is another great plug for consulting is you can really effectively do it part time. And most of the time your clients don't even know that you're working part time. Um, and so further complicated my life by having a second one. So now they're both schooling in the background behind me right now. So once again, as a consultant, I, I did a piece of work for Maya and um, was luckily enough too to be then offered a job in-house. So for, for quite a few years, I was the National Sustainability Manager for Maya. Um, the important part about this one is, and you'll see there the little chains, in, this role really gave me the opportunity to broaden my skill base and my responsibilities into the ethical sourcing area. So I was there doing basically environment stuff and there was a gap there around ethical sourcing. So as Demond spoke to you about before, I saw a gap and I stepped into it and I said, I can do, I can help the business with this. And I think that's something that I encourage all of you to do is to look for those gaps that you can be the person that helps your organisation. After several years at Maya, I moved across into Coles, um, as Meredith explained before. So I was with Coles for five years and so there was a lot, a, a lot happened in those five years, everything from removing plastic bags through to um, targets around recyclability of um, own brand packaging. I was also looking after the animal welfare team, the um, sustainable products, um, own brand nutrition, believe it or not, although no, I know really nothing about nutrition, but it was around the approach of saying, this is what our stakeholders expect. 
Therefore, let's make policy to address that, develop programs and then implement it within our business or our products. And so very much a similar approach across all of those responsibility areas. Um, I was, uh, been very lucky to be heavily involved with APCO through this time. So I sit on the technical advisory committee for um, the PREP tool and also sitting on the collective action group, which is working on the response to the government around the 2025 targets. So just very recently, right at the time when um, the coronavirus um, hit, I moved across to Simplot Australia and I see this as a real opportunity to really hone in on that um, the sustainable packaging area. Um, so it's fantastic, although I haven't actually been into the office yet, believe it or not, so totally working remotely. So do you want to jump to the next slide, Meredith? So I thought I'd just pull out some really quick tips around if you're looking to grow your career, what what you know advice would I give you? So I'd say that you need to know what your definition of sustainability is, but you also need to recognise that other people have a totally different definition. So when you're working with someone either internally or externally, find out what they think it's all about and what they're really hoping to see. I think you can use whatever education experience that you've got and you just use it for what you want it to be. So pull out, focus on the bits that match the need at the time. So probably all of our backgrounds are different, but we can really leverage the things that we've learned in those backgrounds. Um, I think you, the reason you go in this career is because you're passionate. So um, pick the things you're passionate about and really pursue those. Um, for me, packaging, crazily enough, is one of those things. So I'm choosing to specialise in that area now. As I said, consult, consulting is fantastic for broadening your skills and network. So give it a try if you get a chance. And then you really do need to know stuff like what the others were saying about your homework. Know your stuff because you are seen in your organisation as the expert who can help and answer those questions. So make sure that you do know your stuff. But in that, I think you need to avoid jargon and overcomplicated language. There's a lot of jargon that goes around in our own community, which is fine because we all understand what we're talking about. But when you're then presenting to your key stakeholders, let's make sure that we're not using that jargon because it's going to go over people's head or or they think it's all a bit of you know fluffy nonsense um i think you also need to learn your context of your organization and you're going to have to come up against some compromises in order to make a difference so we can have really great pure values and and what we want to achieve but you need to be working within the context that you're in and doing what you can to make a difference so for me it's always like i think will this fly in my current organization and if i don't think it'll fly i need to look at it and go well what can we do um, and some some things will fly and it'll be fine um, so also, sustainability can have a um, tendency to sort of be hanging off the side of an organisation. Oh, there's a sustainability team over there and they do stuff. What we need to do is really integrate what we do into our businesses or other organisations so that they become how they do things every day. So you can be one person, but make sure you're working with the contracts manager in, that's looking after waste. Make sure you're working with the facilities team, the marketing team, whoever they are integrate into the organisation. And then you need to deliver tangible value. That really goes without saying, but really we should be delivering things that the, that the organisation need and want to achieve. Um, continue to add to your skills, like Demet was saying, if it's more education, if it's um, webinars like this, and then actually leverage them. Like, you know, believe in yourself and, and say, yep, I can do that. I know my stuff in that area. And then don't lose fact, you know, lose touch with why you chose this in the first place, that inner fire. So Meredith, next slide. Hopefully I'm not using up too much of time. So around initiatives, I'll run through this quickly. So feel free to ask questions after. But these initiatives should deliver at least, I believe, one of the following. Cost efficiencies, reduced risk to your organisation, whether that be uh, reputational or, or financial or otherwise. Um, it could deliver increased sales, which is would be great, um, and customer loyalty. So if your initiative's not going to deliver any of those things, I think that you really have to say, is this going to fly? Um, do your materiality assessment. So look at the things that are important to your organisation and your stakeholders and focus on those things that are up in that top quadrant. Um, 
so that you're actually resonating internally and externally and and particularly within Coles we we knew our customers had certain pain points so we needed to focus on those things um, the top level buy-in is also critical you're not going to get far without that endorsement at the top and once you've got it use it across the rest of the organization so yes the ELT has signed up to this or so-and-so is really behind this and don't be afraid to then leverage that um, also sort of connected to that is don't try and hog all the credit for the things you do so if you're integrating into your organization make sure that you that they all get to be owners of the credit at the end um, the more people see things as their success and it's going to help them with their KPIs or their own reputation the more they're going to support you to do what you want to achieve um, and so then make sure you monitor your initiative report back continue to report back and then celebrate the successes that your initiative has so so that's my quick tips but yeah look forward to some interesting questions coming forward thanks Meredith thank you Fiona that was great and um, I love love your slide there of the career journey <laughs> It is, it's interesting to see where the pivots kind of happen and where you can step into creating a new role when you see that need, I think. We've all called that out really well. We've got some questions coming through the chat line, a number of different ones. Um, Andrew, I think I'm going to start with you to come back to that. So, um, Andrew, curious to understand your slash the BC SBA perspective on opportunities you can leverage in the Australian context from COVID, the reframing the value of healthy ecosystems on human health to boost support for a circular economy, sustainable agri agricultural practices, anything in that space for your thoughts? Yes, the, um, the $64,000 question at the moment, I suspect. <laughs> um, and there's no one right answer and there's no one um, correct pathway at the moment because of the the multiplicity of challenges that um, coming out of COVID, the recovery from COVID AC is going to look like. But one of the things that we've started um, as the BCSD is a platform to identify what business has started to do to respond to COVID-19. So the website of the WBCSD has been curating now for the last two and a half months, uh, both individual company response to the, uh, to the COVID crisis, whether that's in response to supply chains, um, challenges in relation to small, medium enterprises, um, keeping them credit worthy, the, op uh, the ch opportunities that comes with remote working, uh, re reformulating product into key markets as a result of some of the needs, particularly the health needs that have emerged um, because of COVID. And it's a really interesting um, go-to site to have a look at individual company uh, activity across a variety of sectors. So that's one of the things I would say, go and have a look. As I said before, don't reinvent the wheel. Go and look at what's already been done. And if it's fit for, for your purposes as your organisation, then by all means leverage, uh, which is a quaint word for take and use because somebody else has come up with the idea already. The second um, that we've undertaken is three new projects which we're already working on um, for the members. The first being, how do you ensure vital supply chains? Now, this is not a conversation about offshoring, reshoring, um, and um, talking about taking away activity from key markets, particularly in the developing world, because when you look at the, particularly the membership of the BCSD, it is global. And the challenge is, how do you ensure that you maintain your responsibility as part of stakeholder capitalism in key markets that are highly uh, impacted upon removing manufacturing activity or uh, value creation activity in those key markets, whether it is with um, your consumer markets, particularly companies like Nestle and Unilever, um, or whether it's a manufacturing um, facility, um, for example, Ford and General Motors. The other, the other activity or the other project, uh, two projects we're looking at, return to normal scenarios. And the normal in this case is actually in inverted commas because the expectation here from particularly the BCSD membership is that we won't be returning to the normality that we saw BC before COVID, but there are elements of what was emerging as issues 
um, particularly the role of modern slavery as an important uh, precursor to more effective uh, tracing and identification of product through the supply chain. So how is the leveraging of the work that's being done for compliance purposes going to create greater value over time by tracing from an health and safety perspective, particularly in product to market? The last is the long-term impacts. Um, and this is a piece of work that's actually been undertaken for the last couple of years called Vision 2050. And this, this has just added now COVID-19 to the, the shock effect that those um, or that the COVID has had to bigger issues such as climate change, biodiversity um, loss, and even issues in relation to um, labour hire, not just in the developing world, but also in developed countries where the challenge of long-term unemployment is going to have a material impact in relation to talent identification. It's going to the questions in relation to access to, uh, to key markets for consumers and uh, an emerging role and relevance of the, the company post COVID in what I indicated before, the, the, the world of a stakeholder capitalist. Thank you, Andrew. All right, we've got a couple other questions coming through here. Well, another one, uh, good one um, for Dermot or Fiona and Andrew, feel free to chime in here as well. But if someone's passion area to pursue addressing sustainability does not match with the organization, organization's approach at the same time, then what needs to be done? So if the passion area to pursue addressing sustainability does not match with the organization's approach in the same, then what needs to be done? Any recommendations, Dermot? Um, I, I think the advice uh, Fiona had uh, would be perfect for that. It's really finding, you know, the, the key points of what's important for the business. Obviously, we're, you know, these the businesses were part of our a commercial enterprise. So what we're doing must add value to the business, uh, must reduce risk uh, and important for customers. So I think, uh, you know, as I said, with the, the WISPA work we've been doing five years ago, uh, it would have been difficult to get something like this off the ground, but with the change in what customers are now wanting, uh, it's getting these kind of initiatives started a lot easier. Um, uh, so it's really, getting that link between uh, the initiatives you would like to see uh, uh, taking, getting going in the, in the business and linking them to those, uh, you know, those key areas. Um, yeah, I, that, that's what I'd say. Anything else to add on that, Fiona? Yeah, just really quickly. I think that that sort of situation can come up when, Potentially, it comes down to that definition of what your thinking should be done or, or what sustainability means. Um, and then the organisation actually doesn't see those things as necessarily material. So I think that comes back to, again, what are those things that are material to your organisation, your stakeholders, and to really focus on those things. So you might not even call it sustainability, but you might say that what's important to our customers is, you know, um, recyclable packaging or whatever it might be, actually hone in on those key material issues and start to get some um, re real movement there. Because um, if you're bringing things in that people in the organisation go, oh, I don't know, really know what you're talking about or don't know why we'd do this, it's not resonating with them, you really need to focus in on those material issues. Hopefully that helps. Anything else, Andrew, from your point of view? I would only, uh, only point to a, a real life, or in fact, real time example. Um, Facebook is going through a challenge by its staff pushing back against um, Mark Zuckerberg's position in relation to uh, a recent tweet by um, the President of the United States that has been quite vocal and active by the employees as to a difference of opinion by the, the business owner, in this case Zuckerberg, and the employees in relation to what that position uh, should be. Now, how that will manifest itself is anybody's guess, but in a, in a far more transparent and associate social media live world, um, companies need to understand, I think, that there are other values that do on an ongoing basis need to be taken into account. 
it's a, it's a challenging one. I'm not saying that there's a one size fits all solution here, but in that particular case, you would not have heard of that employee um, disgruntlement five years ago, let alone ten. Now you do because we're, a, we're in one sense a far more transparent world. Now I'm not advocating that employees should go onto social media and complain about their company position. Uh, we'll always work from within. Uh, it is at the end of the day, far more successful. And if it doesn't work, then it's one of those things where if your values don't align with the corporate values of the employer that you are working for, then in a, even in a challenging employment landscape, you have a choice, you have an election to make. Um, and as Fiona's quite beautifully identified, there's the opportunity of moving in and out of the corporate world and playing just as an important role either as a consultant or in government or even in the NGO space over a period of time. So that's how I would answer. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got another one here. So this is a, a great question. So this is um, Prantham and joining as a student pursuing her engineering degree in printing and packaging technology the University of Mumbai, India. So welcome, thanks for joining us all the way from India. Great to have you here. Um, question is, uh, how can we as students try and develop our, pack, our sustainability focus and skills in the packaging industry? Does Zapco or any of the speakers' company provide any online courses, online internship, internships in domains focused mainly on sustainability? Andrew, I don't know, maybe there's something in your wider network that might be able to suggest? As a matter of fact, we have six interns at the moment and they're all working on a variety of um, projects, policy asks and initiatives um, for the membership. Uh, we don't have any specifically on those in relation to the packaging industry because we look to our colleagues and partners at APCO for that particular, particular work. But um, there are platforms of um, internship programs right across the world and Australia and New Zealand particularly have those um, quite strong, um, even at the moment. So I would suggest that they reach out to uh, a num basically a Google search of um, internship programs in Australia and you will find those platforms that may be able to place you. Even at the time of COVID, we, um, we currently have, if memory serves, one in Canberra, one in Wollongong, one in uh, Stratfield, one in uh, Northern Beaches and one in the Gold Coast. And we are all working beautifully remotely. So it, it is possible and it is certainly um, productive, if I can say. Go ahead, yeah, and I'll just add to that, um, APCO's website, the, the documents on that website, particularly the Sustainable Packaging Guidelines, is a great place to start just to get your head around it, around what sustainability means to within the packaging field, um, and to really, I guess, clear, clearly articulate some of the um, issues around um, the, the pyramid of, of what comes before what. So where does composting fit into that hierarchy and and reduction and recycling and all of those things. So I would I'd really encourage um, a, you know just some reading on the documents on the APCO website. They're fantastic. Thanks, Fiona. Anything else to add there, Dermot? You mentioned the um, University of Sydney course that you're looking at. Yeah, I think that's just uh, I think just from the uh, the area she's. Been working on uh, more than qualified. It's I think it's at this stage. It's just going going out and getting that experience. Uh, so I think Andrew's advice there fits very well. Um, I think you know from my position, it's uh, it's been the look of the draw. I've just been able to work for yeah. I, I look, it's probably the best job I've ever had to be honest. And it's just the opportunity's been great to just get in there and, and get the work done. Um, and th that's my experience. Uh, I think finding that network was probably something that I'd recommend there that um, even as a brewer getting work in brewing was was a lot of the time true the networks I'd developed and the people I knew uh, that work in that industry so I think my advice would be definitely uh, build up that network and uh, get yeah build the relationships up uh, with people that work in that area absolutely 
And I guess to add to that kind of from the app and my personal perspective too, is my approach has always been if there's someone that you're interested in, sending them an email, asking when you could take them out for a coffee. And just if you like what they're doing and you like what their organization is doing, just be curious. And I think that's a really yeah. good way to expand that network. And I think all three of the speakers have really emphasized how important that is. And then when you sort of come to someone's mind if a role opens up or you are at least maybe a step ahead of the game in terms of um, understanding what are the hot topics in different sectors and industries. Um, and just to shout out as well, a few of those similar questions, I think you're all welcome to look at these APFA webinars that we've been doing over the past 11 weeks, and that's a good place to get some information. I know Ellen MacArthur Foundation has put out some free courses, and, and there's a number of MOOCs, so like massive online learning courses that you can look into too around circular economy or litter or different spaces there that might be of interest. Um, so I've got probably two more questions here. We have one, Sienna, specifically from Keith. And Keith's question is, uh, what did you find the most effective way of getting senior management on board and establishing sustainable goals for the company? Mm. Um, I think that it depends on the kind of organization that you're working within. If you're working within a listed organization, um, it's very much a um, reporting based analysts want to see what your targets and goals are. So, so really when you're in an organisation such as Maya or Coles, it's around saying, okay, well, what are our um, investors interested in and what, what are our material issues? And let's then um, put some targets in place for that. And so I think that that um, is a simpler path than if you're working for a private organisation where you've got the, well, why? Why do we need to do this? Um, mm. So in those organisations, it is more challenging and that's when you really need to be engaging at that senior level around this is what our customers are looking for. Um, these are the pressures that our organisation is facing. So then if we are going to be focusing on this area, let's give our people something to shoot for and let's give um, the business something to then say, well, yes, well, we've got this target. So therefore that drives the action. Um, so that's really then around that real engagement with that um, top top level whether that be the the owners or the um, executive team um, so yeah so it really depends on your organization so you need to know your organization to choose the best method around how you actually get there hopefully that makes sense i would say so any other advice from either the other dermot or andrew on kind of getting it up to that board level it might be interesting to hear your perspective andrew sitting on and the app board. <laughs> well, we have no trouble getting it to the board level, can I tell you? <laughs> uh, look, I go back to the issue of values. Um, and, and Fiona's right. So some companies are, are wholly embracive, Unilever, for example, whereas others, particularly in the publicly listed space, are challenged by competing uh, agendas. Uh, whether it's short-term uh, dividends, whether it's uh, access to capital, but the, the the thing that's very different from the last over the last five years is the investor interest in ESG, particularly if you're a publicly listed company, and that that has changed and is and is inexorably changing the way in which companies respond to sustainability. In a in private in private companies case, um, yeah, I, I take the other's point, but you do see on occasion, particularly in the private company where the, where the family still owns the business, there's often a, an incredible passion within some of these private companies to see um, action on sustainability at, that, as Fiona and Derm said earlier, doesn't necessarily get badged as sustainability, but is seen as long-term value for the shareholders that just happen to be the family. And so that they, in one sense, see the, the long-term returns on programs that are badged sustainability externally as just legacy programs that these companies take. And, and the most famous of which is Ferrero, because it's not publicly listed. And yet it has one of the most comprehensive CSR campaigns in relation to palm oil, um, hazelnut production, um, and, and and engagement with um, youth in the world. 
So it, it's interesting to see that it, it really does come down to where the values are and how those values are then expressed in the strategic direction of the organisation, whether that's a publicly listed or a private company. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to end with one last question that I'd like each of the speakers to answer. Um, so just what has been your um, an achievement that you're most proud of in your sustainability career? And if anyone that would like to start us off, Dermot, maybe we can start with you. Um, uh, I think it just at this stage, yeah, I, I'd probably say it, it, it is Whisper. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the, the work we've been doing. Um, just the the collective, the that collection of people, and and it, a lot of it is it is uh, volunteer. So it's you know there's nobody been uh, been forced into any of this uh, into this alliance, and the work that they do is basically on top of what is what else they're doing for their organisations. Um, yeah, it, to me it's definitely whisper. Yeah. Thanks, Dermot. Fiona, do you have a response to that? Yeah, um, I hope this doesn't sound too corny, but I think particularly in the last sort of five or so years, I've had the opportunity to have team members come into my team who don't necessarily have a sort of sustainability background and given them the opportunity to take up roles within the team, which basically has allowed them to launch into their very own sustainability career. So, um, you know, some of the team members that I've, I've managed over the last past few years are now, you know, doing sustainability and ethical sourcing in the likes of Bunnings and, and other businesses that, you know, I'm just really glad that not only can I, you know, feel passionate about what I do for work, but that I've given other people that opportunity as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, really thankful that I've had that opportunity. That's fantastic. And Andrew? Um, I'd answer it in, very quickly in one of three ways. Um, what's the most memorable achievement in one's career? Well, it's the next one. It's always the next one. It's got to be because you, you're, you're, you're proud or you're, you're blessed by the opportunities that are given to you in your life. Um, particularly in your career, but you're, you always must be urgent and eager to see, particularly if you're in the sustainability field, that we build on the, sh on the shoulders of others over a, a large number of years now to build better businesses for a more sustainable world. That's, that's, that's our motto. In relation to um, the last 10 years of being the CEO of BCSD, um, under the heading of SDG4, and to pick up on Fiona's point, I think being able to mentor and build capacity in the next generation of sustainability professionals. As I said, we've got six interns at the moment, and it's just so exciting as a sad, tragic, over 55-year-old male to see the enthusiasm and the passion, but also the professionalism that the young generation of sustainability professional in whatever their area they're in, one's in public policy, one's in environmental engineering, one's in finance. It's just fantastic to see the, the complexity of skill sets and qualifications that are coming through into the sustainability uh, arena. And the third is under SDG 17, so partnerships. Um, personally, delighted that we were able to secure the relationship with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in 2014. But then we've added to it with the Women Business Coalition, with a focal point for the Natural Capital Coalition. And we've done that for the benefit of both the Australian membership, but also to get the message of what Australian business does out to a broader international community, particularly as there is a, a narrative that Australia doesn't do enough in this space, and that is manifestly untrue. And in some cases, they are world leaders in what they do. So the ability then to leverage and localise and, and really align those business actions on, on a sustainability ag agenda across the world has been, I think, one of uh, the great success stories of this organisation. Absolutely. Well, thank you all. I think we've kind of tried to sum up as best we could some of those key points that you mentioned. So getting to know your market, broadening your knowledge, use those right resources, ask questions, be curious, collaborate, celebrate your success, 
I think a lot about that collaboration, speaking to others and, and helping to always work with each other as we go moving forward. So a huge thank you to all three speakers and to everyone that was able to attend this session today. We are really proud of all the work that we're doing here in Australia. And like you said, Andrew, it is, it's phenomenal and it's definitely not to be underestimated. So thank you everyone. If we didn't get to your questions today, feel free to send them through to the team and we'll be sure to get back to you. And I'm hoping that you can all join us again next week when Alison will be taking us through a deep dive on soft plastics and what brands can be doing um, with Liz Cassell and Samantha Cross. And again, thank you to all of the speakers for your time today. Thank Thanks, you. Meredith. Thanks, Meredith. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.